All right, guys, so our next topic is chest pain. And if a patient comes in with chest pain, the first thing you want to do is to determine whether or not this chest pain is due to coronary artery disease or some kind of ischemic cause, okay? And it's not here in the algorithm, but basically what you're going to look for in the stem is whether or not they have risk factors. Now, there's major and there's minor risk factors. Um, the major risk factors include things like diabetes, which is coronary artery risk factor equivalent, and it's probably the greatest risk factor. Um, smoking is another one, which is the most preventable risk factor. Uh, family history, hypertension, uh, HDL, less than 40 in males or less than 50 in females. Um, you're going to look for minor risk factors such as age, obesity, an estrogen deficiency, or possibly even a homocystinemia. Now, what we want to do is first look at the history, and then we want to look at the presentation. So if it changes with position, this is going to most probably be pericarditis, and it's not going to be a coronary artery disease. If it changes with respiration, you're going to look for all the P's, the pulmonary embolism, the pneumonia, the pleuritis, the pneumothorax, and the pericarditis. And if you have a chest pain that changes with, I'm sorry, a chest pain that has wall tenderness along with it, you're going to be thinking costal chondritis. So if you rule these things out, and based on the history, you think that this could be a coronary artery disease um, in etiology, then what you're going to do is you're going to do an EKG, and you're going to do your cardiac enzymes. The thing you want to also, the thing you want to realize is, it, is if it's a clear-cut case of ischemic pain with a, with a very strong history of coronary artery disease, you're going to treat first. You're going to treat them with aspirin first, okay? This is just if you're suspecting a coronary artery disease. So what you're going to do is you're going to do an EKG and enzymes. Remember, enzymes include things like myoglobin, CKMB, and troponin. Myoglobin is the first enzyme to come up. Uh, CKMB is the best to detect reinfarction, and troponin is usually your best overall test. Now, if your cardiac enzymes are positive, you have to hospitalize these patients immediately, okay? And as you guys probably know, all patients should get your Mona. Um, your morphine is your M. It's given for severe pain. Um, they have to get the O, which is oxygen. Uh, they have to get the N, the nitroglycerin, which is going to reduce both preload and afterload. And obviously, they're going to get aspirin. Remember, aspirin is your single best answer all the time, okay? And then you can also give uh, an ACE inhibitor to prevent remodeling. Now, if the cardiac enzymes are positive and that EKG shows an ST depression, this is known as an n STEMI or a non-ST elevation MI. Now, how are you going to distinguish between an ST depression due to unstable angina versus an ST depression due to a non-STEMI MI? Well, the cardiac enzymes are going to be positive. Okay, so if you did the EKG and the cardiac enzymes are positive and you see an ST depression, this is an N-STEMI, a non-STEMI. Okay, and we said already that we're going to do aspirin, morphine, oxygen, nitrates, and a beta blocker. And these patients are going to need an immediate coronary uh, catheterization. Um, it's only the, the coronary catheterization is only your next best step as long as it can be performed within 90 minutes. But it can actually be delayed for 48 hours while the patient's being stabilized. Um, this coronary catheterization is much more important to be done early in STEMI than it is for N-STEMI. And then you're going to add either IV heparin or a low molecular weight heparin. IV heparin is actually preferred if procedures are planned, and a low molecular weight heparin is actually preferred if there is no invasive procedures planned. So we went over what we're going to do in a patient with chest pain that we um, thought may be uh, coronary artery disease. We did an EKG and they had positive enzymes and they had an ST depression with positive enzymes. So that's the N STEMI that we know about, okay? Next is if a patient 
has an EKG and enzymes that are done. And the initial EKG or the enzymes don't establish the diagnosis, but you still suspect coronary artery disease. In that case, what you're going to do is an exercise stress test. The exercise stress test is the best of all methods to evaluate um, ischemic heart disease. And it's going to be positive when there's greater than or equal to 2 millimeters ST segment depression and or a drop of more than 10 millimeters of systolic blood pressure. Now, there's contraindications to exercise stress tests. And that includes things like a patient being able to un uh, being not able to exercise for any reason. They may be uh, have a disability. They may have amputation. Um, a valvular disease actually places the patient at a risk of syncope. If they have any type of arrhythmias, you can't do an exercise stress test. Um, if they have unstable coronary artery disease or severe congestive heart failure, you also can't do an exercise stress test. So there's these two cases where you have a patient unable to read an EKG on a patient or a patient unable to exercise. Now the cases where you're unable to read an EKG include things like a baseline ST depression, a left ventricular hypertrophy, uh, digoxin, a left bundle br bl branch block. They may have a pacemaker in place and you can't read the EKG. Um, Wolf Parkinson pre-excitation syndromes, um, a prior history of revascularization. In all these cases, you're not able to read the EKG. So what you're going to do is you're going to do either a stre stress echo or a stress thallium test. Now, if you do the stress echo and there's a decreased wall motion, that means the patient is ischemic. If you do a stress thallium test and there's a decreased thallium uptake, then you got to see is this at stress and at rest or is this decreased thallium uptake only um, during stress with a reversal of thallium uptake at rest. So if you did the stress thallium, which is also known as a technetium 99 sestamibi thallium perfusion imaging, you may hear that, and you see a decreased thallium uptake, you got to see whether or not it's only during stress or at stress and rest. If it's only at stress and there's a reversal of thallium uptake at rest, it's ischemia. And if it's at stress and rest, then it's going to be usually due to an infarction. And for any of these stress tests, whether it be the exercise stress test, the stress R, uh, echocardiogram, or the stress thallium, um, Angiography is going to be the next diagnostic test to evaluate an abnormal stress test, okay, that shows reversible ischemia. Um, once the angiogram has been done, you can do a coronary bypass on these patients. So now we've gone over a uh, patient with chest pain and we did the EKG and positive enzymes. We, we managed them for an NSTEMI and we managed them if the EKG and enzymes didn't show us exactly what was going on but we're still suspecting coronary artery disease and we went to a stress test, exercise stress test, and if the exercise stress test wasn't able to be done due to EKG findings, we know how to manage them up. And if they're not able to be done due to exercise, it's going to be a little bit different. If a patient's unable to exercise, we're going to do one of two things, either a dobutamine echocardiogram or persantine dipyrimidol and thallium. If the patient's unable to exercise and we did the dobutamine echocardiogram and it shows a decreased wall motion, this means it's ischemia. And if the patient's unable to exercise and the persantine dipyrimidol and thallium is done is a decreased thallium uptake, this means also that there's ischemia. Now, if we have a patient with chest pain, we presume we're thinking it's coronary artery disease. We did an EKG and enzymes. The enzymes are positive, and the EKG shows ST elevation in two or more continuous leads. Remember, the first thing we're going to always do is aspirin. And usually, 
immediate coronary catheterization is the next best step in management, um, as long as it can be performed within 90 minutes of arrival in the ER. Um, TPA, it's not as indicated as angioplasty because there's criteria for TPA. And it's most effective if given within six hours, and it's effective for up to 12 hours, okay? And your indications for thrombolytics include chest pain starting within the last 12 hours, over a one millimeter ST elevation, and a new left bundle branch block. But the things we have to worry about are the contraindications. You can't give TPA if they have a GI bleed, if they had any history of an intracranial hemorrhage, any type of recent surgery, if they've had an aortic dissection, or if they have active internal bleeding. So the indications for thrombolytics are far and few between. And basically, to revascularize any of these patients, um, we can use percutaneous coronary intervention, this PCI that we've been talking about. Um, and PCI includes things such as angioplasty, atherectomy uh, and stenting, um, but there's indications for coronary artery bypass grafting as well. And cabbage is indicated if there's evidence of significant left main coronary artery disease, if there's a greater than 70% stenosis of the proximal left anterior descending artery and proximal left circumflex arteries, if there's three vessel coronary artery disease, if there's significant proximal LAD disease with one or two vessel disease plus an ejection fraction of less than 50% and or a large area of myocardium at risk of non-invasive testing, or if there's a one or two vessel disease with a large area of, um, of risk um, for myocardial disease and a high risk criteria on non-invasive testing. In any of these, you're going to do a cabbage instead of the percutaneous coronary intervention, this PCI. Now, if there's still evidence of ongoing ischemia after the thrombolytic or angioplastic administration, you're going to do an emergency coronary bypass. Remember, if a patient is allergic to aspirin, you're going to give them clopidogrel, but you have to stop these five days before any major surgery. Um, and we talked about if there, if, uh, on angiography, if there's three vessel disease or left main, you're going to do cabbage. And if you have an MI without ST elevation, you're going to use glycoprotein 2B3A inhibitors instead of thrombolytics, okay? And post-MI, you have to give these patients statins, beta blockers, and ACE inhibitors. And last but not least, remember, after the treatment of an MI, patients can resume sexual activity within six weeks. All right, so I hope you guys enjoyed that. I'm going to try to follow this up with uh, an algorithm for STEMI versus non-STEMI. I know there's a lot that we try to squeeze into one algorithm, um, but following algorithms hopefully can make this a little bit more understandable. But these are the steps that you need to do if you have a patient with chest pain and you're suspecting an MI, okay? Study hard and enjoy.